Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the April Zoom Citrus Workshop. Thank you for joining us. First, I would like to thank Alison Walton from the Immokalee IFS Center for her help and cooperation. Today's program offers one CEU for pesticide license renewal and one CEU for certified crop advisors. If you need CEUs, email me your name, email address, and license number. Today's program will focus on solid and leaf miner research and management. It will be an update for you. Our guest speaker is Dr. Lucas Zelensky, professor in entomology at UF IFES Citrus Research and Education Center in Lake Alfred. As you know, the Asian citrus salad is the worst insect pest of citrus due to its role as a vector of the pathogen that causes citrus greening disease or HLB. Citrus salad control slows the spread of citrus greening, reduces the reinoculation of the pathogen and allows the tree to produce healthy flush. Therefore, vector control is a critical component of HLB management. Cellid density is related to tree stress. As cellid numbers increase, tree stress increases, compromising tree health and yield. As the pest population continues to rise, it reaches a point where the resulting damage would justify taking control measures. A new alternative being developed for suppressing the citrus salad population is the use of PT proteins produced by bacteria. PT are naturally derived bacteria that produce ACP killing proteins. Dr. Stelensky and his team have developed both a transgenic citrus that produces its own ACP killing BT and have delivered into the tree floor with citrus tristeza virus as the delivery vehicle. Both methods show promise. Concerning the citrus, the citrus leaf miner, the citrus leaf miner has been a devastating insect pests in the citrus as well. The spring and summer period of high, leaf, of high leaf minor damage coincides with the rainy season when, cup, when canker spread is most likely. So leaf minor damaged leaves are more likely to become sites for new canker infection. While several insecticides are effective against this pest, achieving control of leaf minor using foliar sprays on large trees is difficult due to the unsynchronized flush during summer and fall. For citrus leaf miner, the window for spraying against it is between two weeks to one month after bud break. Pheromone mating disruption interferes with leaf miner mating, which decreases infestation. Several formulations have been available over the years, but a new and less expensive technology for citrus leaf minor disruption is being registered. Dr. Stelensky, it's all yours. Please go ahead. Thanks, Manji. Um, what I'm gonna do is try to uh, <clears throat> combine um, recommendations that I think we should all be reminded of uh, with new results throughout the uh, presentation to uh, give everyone kind of an update of, of what we've been doing and um, where we're going with, with the uh, research. But I will try to frame it all uh, in the context of how can we use this information for our uh, current um, situation for practical use in the in the field. Um, so the question that we've I've discussed multiple times 
when I've uh, met with growers over the past several years is, you know, whether we still need to do anything about citrus psyllids. And I know that in the current situation that we find ourselves in, uh, resources are limited. So we have to um, dole those resources out as um, efficiently and economically as possible um, so that we're not um, wasting money. Um, so if you don't do anything for HLB control or psyllid management, it, it does have consequences. And, and, and these pictures simply show you trees over time with or without psyllids and, and with or without HLB. And where we did this in an experiment and we manipulated the trees. So we, um, and, and this was done in a replicated fashion, but I'm just giving uh, uh, pictures over time uh, of, of trees that were infested with psyllids at various um, frequencies of infestation over time. Uh, and the psyllids either carried the bacteria or didn't carry the bacteria. So you can, you can manipulate it with and without HLB. And this is a year after the, the, the trees were, um, we began infecting trees. And what these pictures will show on top is, is with HLB and on the bottom without HLB. Um, so these, the trees that I've shown so far on the left, these just had psyllids on them for a week, um, just at the very beginning of the experiment. So imagine these had psyllids on them for a week a year ago, okay? And the top ones with HLB, it was psyllids with H that carried the bacterium. And the bottom one, psyllids that didn't carry the bacterium. And after a week, we killed all the psyllids off. And these trees were in cups-like enclosures to prevent any other psyllids. So you just, they just grew for a year, right? And the top trees did become infected with the pathogen and, and, and got HLB and then didn't have psyllids for the rest of the time. And, and you can see a difference. They, they did be, uh, the, the, the pathogen did take hold in the, in the flow. So they, they got the disease. And, and you can see that the, the bottom tree is essentially complete control, right? The, a complete negative control. These are perfectly healthy trees that haven't seen psyllids for a year. And, and it looks like a, a tree that's about, should, you know, five, five years old um, without, without psyllids. The top one with HLB, you could see it's lost some foliage. You could kind of see through that tree. Um, in, in the background, it's 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 lost some leaves, but it, it looks all right. I mean, it, it's 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 definitely not on death's door, um, but it, it, it certainly has symptoms of 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 the disease. But you can keep your trees looking like that, like the top one with HLB, um, and and there are certainly a lot of trees like that in Florida right now, um, when when psyllids are kept off of them uh, after they get the pathogen. Now. Back when we were um, treating psyllids every month, um, we would kind of knock them back every month and then, and then get reinfested. So I, I did that kind of um, treatment also, um, where, and, and, and that's this um, next uh, set of trees. So these are getting infested with psyllids every month. Um, on the bottom, they're getting infested with psyllids that don't have the pathogen. So that's HLB negative in blue. It just, those trees just see psyllids, but no, no pathogen. And the top ones every month, they get psyllids with, with the pathogen. And so those trees on top are infected, the trees on the bottom are uninfected. But every month after we infest the, the trees with the psyllids, we then kill the psyllids off a week later. <clears throat> and again, you can see, the influence of the pathogen, right? The, the, the tree on top has disease. <clears throat> it's, a, it's yellowed. You can see in the top right corner, it's lost some leaves. Um, while, while the tree on the bottom that just had psyllids um, looks, looks perfectly healthy. I mean, it's dark green and full of foliage. And again, that tree on top is, is kind of like what a lot of trees look like in Florida in the field. Um, where, where psyllids are managed um, and um, 
but um, but the infection is can't you know can't be prevented. Um, the, the the trees still get infected, and then then on the very right hand side is if we did absolutely nothing. Um, on top, if we just infested trees for a year with psyllids that are infected, and on the bottom it just shows if we infested trees for a year without infection, just psyllids, um, but but no HLB. And you can see in both cases the the psyllids hammer the trees. Um, they they absolutely um, decrease the health. Uh, you see those trees have, have dropped a lot of foliage. Um, but the, the one on top with the pathogen and the psyllid, um, it, it really looks uh, horrible. I mean, that one's on, on death's door. So, so this is essentially if, if you just kind of, you know, in a controlled setting, measured the effects of the psyllid and the pathogen either together or, or tried to parse them out of, of what these two forces, the insect itself and then the insect plus the pathogen do to the tree. And, and the, the reason I show these pictures in, in this slide is just to, to reiterate that that psyllid management that we do uh, is providing some benefit. I mean, it's 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 certainly not going for um, for uh, it, it's not completely money out the window. It, it's it's providing some health benefit uh, to those trees, and it's it's providing a health benefit even if the trees are infected with the pathogen, right? So that that on in the top row in the center, that's a tree that's had HLB for a year. But those, those and had psyllids on it every month for a year. But every month those psyllids are taken off compared to the right hand side. If you didn't take off those psyllids, that 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 those trees would would be uh, pushed over their their physiological capabilities. And when you keep the psyllids off, that tree is able to defend itself um, against the pathogen. So what? So again. Managing the psyllids does something. It, 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 even if you have pathogen, it's 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 providing some health benefit. But we don't have to necessarily spray um, every month. We don't have to be on this calendar. And what I've been suggesting over the past few years, really following along with what um, Dr. Phil Stansley had been working on prior to his passing, was to 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 uh, implement it, a threshold based on monitoring to guide your spray decisions. So, um, and so what this is, is, is spraying for psyllids when there's, when there's actually a need. <clears throat> However, this, this method of spraying is a hybrid because it's not exactly um, all based on monitoring. There are certain sprays that we have to do, and I'll just remind everyone, that are kind of basic. If, if you're going to do, if you only have the, 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 the funds to spray once or twice for psyllids every year, that should be done uh, as we've been saying now for years during the dormant season. And in, in our data suggests that you should even pull it back, even not just um, during the dormant season, just any time, but at, at bud break, before the new flush is present, really just, just as those, those, those flush are beginning to bud, um, that's, that's the best time to knock down the psyllid populations before they start reproducing on the flush. And in some cases, that one spray during the bud break will get you through um, all the way, um, or, or, or could get you through all the way until bloom. However, it's important to look at the new flush uh, when, when they start to uh, develop from those buds. And if those new flush are infested, if that bud break spray didn't do it, you know, didn't knock down the populations, if, they're, if, you're, if your new flush are just loaded, even though you put out that bud break spray, it might be um, <clears throat> important to put on a second dormant season application, spraying the visible flush if and when the psyllids do reappear. Now, if they don't, then then I would suggest holding off. But if your if your new flush are covered, even though you applied that bud break spray, 
then, then it would be useful to spray again on the visible flush. And that's when the, the, the threshold comes in. <clears throat> now you can monitor with tap sampling <clears throat> and you can set a threshold and a conservative threshold is uh, a fraction of a psyllids per tap. And that fraction is about 0.2 psyllids. And the way you measure that fraction is you, you tap sample 10 trees in your block. So you, you go up to 10 branches in 10 trees, you tap those three times and on your sheet below your, the branch that you're tap, tapping, you count all the psyllids that land. And hopefully there's not a lot of psyllids landing. And then you, from those 10, you take an average. And if that average is greater than 0.2, which is a fraction of a psyllid, it's, it's less than one psyllid, then you've reached your threshold <clears throat> and it's time to spray. And um, so first of all, that those dormant season applications should give you 60 plus days of low psyllid populations and it should get you through the bloom. And then that's when you start doing this, this tap sampling. And when you reach your threshold, you, you know it's time to spray. And the, the, the important thing about it is that you're, you're reaching a threshold when the psyllids are actually doing that damage to the trees that's preventing the tree from protecting itself. It's, it's, it, what the psyllid feeding does is that it, it, it affects the, 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 the tree's immune response. The trees have a natural defense system. They have an, a, 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 an immune response against uh, pathogens like HLB. What, what, the, what, what HLB is, is Neon Wong has shown, it's, it's essentially a, a disease of the immune system. Um, so so that, that, that immune system is, is being turned on by the pathogen and by the psyllid. But if, if you get too much psyllid damage, it compromises this, the, the tree's ability to defend itself. And then, and then you get all that leaf drop and fruit drop. But if, you, if you're able to keep the psyllid below that damaging population, you can you can keep that tree um, uh, with keep that tree so with with a, a functioning immune response. So if you if you if you knock the psyllids back when you reach the threshold, you can keep that tree so, so chugging along. And then you keep you keep um, <clears throat> you keep monitoring. And if you reach the threshold again, then it's time to to to, to spray again. And what this does is it takes you off a calendar-based approach and it allows you to treat the tree when the tree needs to be treated, when the psyllid populations are, are, are getting higher. And you might find that some of these sprays are, are, are closer together and it's just during the natural time when the psyllid populations are following the tree's phenology and increasing as, as the flush increases. Now, the area under the threshold when you're not spraying is hopefully when your, your biological control is, is, is having uh, some impact. Now, the assumptions of this type of management system um, is that you're, you're not trying to prevent HLB infection. You're, um, hopefully, you're, you're, if you're putting on um, the IPCs, those are preventing infection. Um, th this, this type of management strategy will, will, will not prevent infection. Um, but what we've shown is that in areas that are 100% infected, as long as you could keep psyllids below this threshold, below this threshold where they damage the tree's immune response, you can boost yield. Um, so the assumption here is that by, by reducing the psyllid damage, you're, you're improving tree health and, 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 and boosting yield. Uh, all the while, you're decreasing input costs because you're getting off of a a calendar-based approach that would have you spraying every month on this constant calendar cycle, which is which is very expensive and it's 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 not sustainable. Um, and what we found is we could we can reduce sprays this this from from the twelve that we had been applying you know eight to ten years ago down to about five or six sprays and and you get essentially the same result you would with the calendar-based application. So here's an example um, where we compared a calendar-based application where we're applying every month with 
with three different thresholds. We did that conservative threshold that I just told you about, 0.2 silits per tap. And then we tried to kind of ease off that threshold to see if we can, we can handle uh, greater silid population density. So we went to a 0.5 silid per tap threshold and all the way up to a one silid per tap threshold where we're only spraying if on average we get one silid per tap. Um, and as you, as you increase the threshold, you're, you're going to be spraying less. Um, so that 0.2 silid per tap threshold, that conservative low threshold, uh, triggers more sprays than one silid per tap. And what these data are showing is over time, these are the cumulative number of silids that we counted in the plots. And if, if you look at the data this way, um, really, we, we, we didn't see a, 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 a significant difference in psyllid populations, whether we were doing the lowest, most conservative threshold or, or spraying every month. The, the psyllid populations were, were similar. But when we looked at things like spiders, um, we found that spider density increased in, in some of these threshold plots. So it, it did seem that we were getting, by, by reducing the insect, insecticide input, we were, we, were, we were allowing some of these beneficial insects to kind of come back and, and, and start to appear in our groves, which, which we think might be contributing to the overall lack of difference between the insecticide inputs, uh, the threshold and the calendar sprays, because maybe we're getting some benefit of these biological controls by, by using uh, less insecticide input. Then when we looked at um, the, the fruit counts per, per, uh, uh, per tree in this particular um, um, uh, study, we, we didn't see an, an effect of the insecticide treatment. So the, the, by, by reducing the number of sprays, uh, by putting in the, the threshold, it, it didn't have a negative impact on, on the overall yield compared to spraying every month. And then when we did the, the calculations, you can see this is uh, on, on the left-hand side was the management approach, the calendar, and then the three thresholds ranging from the 0.2 silids per tap all the way to the one silid per tap. You can see when, when the, when we, the, the higher the threshold, the fewer the sprays. So with one silid per tap, that, that triggered only three sprays in, in this particular um, experiment. And then all these blocks also got um, two dormant season applications. So on top of the two dormant season applications, the, 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 the one silid per tap threshold got only three additional sprays. The half a silid per threshold only got four additional sprays. And the 0.2 silid per threshold, the very um, uh, conservative threshold in this particular uh, experiment only saved one spray over, over the calendar. Um, but you can see the yield loss um, uh, did not um, increase with in, by, by greatly compared to the calendar uh, by implementing the threshold, but the total cost decreased dramatically because we were, we were inputting um, much less, much less uh, chemical investment into the plots that were used in the thresholds. And, and hopefully we were treating those trees at the times when, when the psyllids were causing the most damage. And, and we got away with, in, in, in the one psyllid per tap, we got away with only three sprays um, and, and the total costs per acre, which were, were much lower and, 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 our, um, <clears throat> and our yield loss uh, was was uh, not significantly different compared to the calendar. Now, what what I'm hoping um, that we can achieve is by decreasing the insecticide inputs by by spraying um, at the, at the most important times of the year, we can save that money to invest then into these oxy tetracycline treatments that are becoming more popular. 
Um, and, and these OTC evaluations, you know, we've, we've tested the um, anti-bacterial uh, um, treatments as foliar sprays in the past, and we didn't get good results. Um, um, in, in the one test that I was part of that we published, the, the foliar sprays, um, it just didn't work. They, 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 you couldn't get enough of um, the um, antibiotic into the tree with the foliar sprays. I mean, they had some effect. They had some measurable effects that you, you, you knew it was there, but it, it, it just, it, it wasn't worth the cost. But our preliminary or early evaluations with the trunk injected OTCs are, are night and day difference. I mean, this, this seems to be working, unlike the, um, the foliar applications. At least it's having a much, much greater effect. So these are, I'll show you some data from preliminary evaluations. Now here, there was a test that we did in, in Hamlin Sweet Orange. And you can see there are five treatments here. Um, and these first three treatments are kind of less important in my story, but these are antimicrobials that we were testing um, as, as comparisons to um, the oxytetracycline, which is an antibiotic. So we were trying to do these other antimicrobial treatments that aren't antibiotics, um, just um, to get something that um, would be more consumer friendly because you, you may have heard in the news and sometimes just treating with antibiotics has, um, can, can have, um, um, well, public opinion can, can be negative. Um, so th that was the purpose of trying some of these others um, compared to an insecticide only. And the bottom line is really the OTC, the ox oxytetracycline uh, was the only one that worked, but it, it, it really seems to work. Um, so the first thing we did is we treated trees. You could see the, the, the size of the trees. We treated pots of trees with um, each, of these, uh, each of these treatments. And our, our complete negative control is just insecticides, um, which is, you know, because in, in, these, in these blocks, we, we couldn't um, have completely negative controls. And then we, we caged psyllids um, uh, a month after application. On, on these trees and looked at what psyllids would acquire from those trees, right? So, uh, and, it, and so we measured the bacteria in the psyllids. We, we caged psyllids from a, a colony in the laboratory that didn't have the pathogen and, um, that were negative. And, and then after caging them on the trees for a week, we collected those psyllids and then measured what was inside the psyllids. And you can see from all our anti-microbial um, uh, alternatives, all the psyllids came back positive from those uh, field trees. Um, our insecticide only, which is the complete negative control, had, had the most uh, of the CLOS bacterium in them. But on those trees that we treated with the Fireline OTC, in this case, the, it was a Fireline treatment, um, Oh, it, that was trunk injected, and this was a, an experimental um, type uh, uh, treatment. We, we really decreased the, um, the bacteria that the psyllids were able to acquire. So we had a, we had a pretty big effect. I mean, this was, this was pretty surprising to me. Um, then what we did also is we would cage adults on these treated trees in, in the um, field and then pull them off those trees and put those psyllids on uh, seedling trees that were uninfected and look at the plant infection rate. And what we found was when, uh, look at the insecticide only, um, at, the, at the end of the experiment, 100% of the psyllids that we pulled off of the trees in the field that were treated with insecticide only, 100% of the trees that were exposed to psyllids that were taken off those trees became infected. Whereas none of the psyllids that were pulled off the OTC treated trees in the field uh, by trunk injection, none of those psyllids infected other trees. 
um, which was which was spectacular. Um, well, it was for me. It was uh, kind of an eye-opening result. Now we also measured bacterial titers in the uh, trees that had been um, subjected to the various treatments. These other antimicrobials compared to the oxytet with the insecticide only, and you could see the insecticide only uh, is in white. So this is the day zero. This is the relative abundance of, of the pathogen DNA in those trees. And then two days later, seven days later, 30 days later, 60 days later, and 90 days later. And by 60 and 90 days, it didn't come out statistically significant um, because of the variation in bacterial titer. So you could take these results with a grain of salt. Um, but it was meaningful to me that you could see that with the oxytet, that bar is reduced compared to the insecticide only. And it's really the only bar at 16, 90 days that's, that's really showing me a, a consistent trend of reduction. Um, this was a small plot experiment. The replication was, was rather low and we're doing this on a much larger scale. But it was kind of showing me that this, this oxytet when, by trunk injection was, was doing something. And it was doing something a lot more than I've ever seen with, um, with foliar sprays. Um, so we're taking this um, uh, to the field in um, a much bigger way this season. We're evaluating both the remedium and, and rectify OTC treatments, um, where we're looking at um, a rate study between 5,500 to 11,000 parts per million. We're, we're going to be, we're doing this in, in Valencia and Hamlin, and we're measuring bacterial titer, psyllid acquisition, and tree health. And this is going to be a, a two year study. And like I said, this is all just um, getting underway now. The, the treatments um, are being applied or, or have been applied. Uh, and, and really, the, the first months. Uh, data uh, counts are going to be done uh, in early May. So, um, but I'm, I'm pretty excited about this um, because based on those, those data that I just showed you, those are pre pretty much the most impressive that I've seen so far with, with the trunk injection compared to the type of foliar spray data that, that we've seen to date. So another, um, thing that we've been pursuing is to try to make the host, the, the tree host, a, a lethal sink. Um, so the current management of, of psyllids is, is really expensive and, and there have been issues with insecticide resistance. So we've been trying to see if we can manipulate the tree for increased self-defense. And, and one way to do this is to get a BT toxin into the tree. Now, you, you might have heard of BTs. This is Bacillus thuringiensis. This is a naturally occurring bacterium. Um, and this bacterium just happens to produce a protein um, that kills insects. And, and, and this was kind of found years ago. Um, and, and somebody found this property of this bacterium it just kind of occurs in the soil. Um, and, and, and this naturally occurring protein kills insects. And it kills insects very specifically. Um, so certain, certain bacterial species will only kill a very small subset of insects. Um, and, and, um, uh, and it doesn't kill vertebrates. It does, has no effect on vertebrates. So it's, it's a very specific to insects, insecticide. And even within insects, it's not broad spectrum. So uh, these, these proteins typically kill um, lepidopter like moths and beetles. So in agriculture, this thing has most of its use in like cotton and corn, and it, it mostly um, is used against those boring moths that bore in the corn and, and, and various beetles that attack cotton. Um, so we actually tweak and engineer this, this um, toxin a bit this, in, in, that the bacteria is producing um, so that it kills psyllids. And we can get it into the plant sap two ways. We can either engineer a plant virus, CTV, that, that can infect the plant phloem. And, and then when the psyllid feeds on the plant phloem, the virus is replicating. The virus is not doing anything to the plant. It doesn't cause any 
um, negative effects on the plant, but it just it just reproduces itself in the plant sap, and by reproducing itself, it reproduces the the um, the Bt protein. Or secondly, we can just create a genetically engineered plant um, that systemically produces the protein in its flow. And then when the psyllid lands on these plants, it feeds on it and it dies. Um, and in fact, we've done this. We've engineered um, uh, both Valencia, Duncan, um, and we've in engineered um, citrus uh, relatives like Bergeria canigiae um, to produce these BTs. And these, these engineered plants are now, we've had them now uh, for two years, but we've gotten to the point where we can, we can get uh, consistent data from these. Um, and, and when you put psyllids on these, on these transgenic plants that produce the BT compared to control plants, they kill the psyllids. I mean, these, these plants kill the psyllids. Um, these are uh, uh, data here with um, uh, uh, Bergeria um, uh, canigiae, which is a citrus relative, which is highly attractive to psyllids. It's more attractive than, than, than citrus hosts. Um, so the idea here with this Bergeria um, is, you know, we wanted to kind of um, get away from using, uh, of, of, of transforming the, the whole crop. The, the idea here is to maybe use Bergeria as a trap crop to plant around citrus. Um, but we can engineer the citrus itself and, and then the citrus kills psyllids. And you can see the way it kills psyllids is th these BT proteins create holes in the psyllid gut. So if we pull psyllids off the control plants, um, and on the left-hand side, this wild type, this is a, um, a cross-section of a normal psyllid gut. And so you can see, it. this is just, this is the, the lumen inside the, the inside of the gut, and this is the, the gut wall, um, and just the cross-section. And if you look at this, the same gut off of a, of a psyllid that was pulled off one of these transgenic plants, it, it's, it's got all these pock marks kind of holes in it. And, and that's what the, the bacteria does. It just kind of dissolves the psyllid's gut and, and, and kills the psyllid. Um, so it, it really works well. Um, and as I was mentioning, the idea with the, with the Bergeria, uh, Bergeria canigiae would be to have a, a hyper-attractive uh, trap crop around it now, if, if we could get um, consumers to um, uh, accept the transgenic plot, uh, plant, the, the, these would work, it would work best. I mean, you can have essentially a whole crop of these trees that would be killing psyllids. But one of the things we're trying to do now is to see if we can, um, we can have a, uh, a promoter that's specific to um, uh, the, the rootstock and not the scion and whether the BT would travel into the scion so that the, 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 the scion wouldn't be producing the, the BT. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that this BT does nothing to humans. I mean, it, 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 it's, it, it's just the, the idea of a, of a transgenic crop um, does have um, a burden of uh, consumer acceptance. Now, um, so I'm going to conclude here and, and move to, to leaf miners. Psyllid density is related to tree stress. The, the more psyllids you have, uh, the, 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 the more damage. And this is going to compromise health, which compromises yield. We need to remember to spray for adults during that dormant season, at bud break, at the beginning of the first flush, before there's a feather flush on which the uh, adults can lay eggs. And then um, a conservative threshold, if you're going to use tap sampling to uh, predict whether or not you need to spray, a conservative threshold um, is 0.2 psyllids per tap if you tap 10 trees. If you wanted to start out trying this conservatively, um, 0.2 psyllids per tap would be the way to go. But we found that up to one psyllid per tap, um, we're, we're not finding a, a measurable decrease in, in yield. Um, and these trunk injected OTC treatments seem to be showing promising results. Um, and we should have more data um, for, as this field season progresses. 
but I'm, I'm excited about this and I'm excited about the idea of, of, of saving money on psyllid sprays using thresholds and then investing that money um, into these OTC treatments. Now, citrus leaf miner is, is another one and, and depending on um, what your, uh, if you're, you know, what your purpose is, fresh fruit versus, um, versus processed fruit, it, it might be a bigger headache um, in some cases than, than the citrus leaf miner. Of course, it can, it can hamper uh, growth and, and oftentimes these wounds caused by the citrus leaf miner are, are associated with canker lesions. Essentially, the, 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 these are, these are the open wounds that the, that the leaf miner causes when it's, when it's feeding. And, and that saliva that the uh, larva produces while it's feeding prevents the, the leaf from healing up. And it, it, it widens the, the window of opportunity for, for canker to, to then come in there and uh, infest those, those wounds caused by the leaf miner. And when you, when you decrease the, the number of, of, of leaf miner mines, you can, you can show a measurable decrease in canker. Now there's, there's quite a bit of a, um, a toolbox for management of leaf miner in terms of the chemicals that are uh, effective. And, and some of these chemicals will have um, multi species effectiveness. So you can use them for leaf miner and, 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 and know that you're getting psyllid protection. Alternatively, you, if, you're, if you're really, if your management program revolves around Asian citrus psyllid, you, you might want to choose the ones that um, will also have an effect on, on uh, CLM. There's really only a couple, like Intrepid, for example, um, this one's going to have no effect on on um, on psyllids, but it's a really really good um, uh, leaf miner uh, product. And here I have a mistake. Delegate will have effects on on psyllids, in addition to to leaf miner. Um, uh, and of course, then there's the the soil applied, um, both the neonix and anything with cyazapir um, will. Um, Will have an effect on on CLM. In fact, cyazapir is a, just a, a great um, chemical against. Uh, uh, it's in exeril, for example. It's it's a great leaf miner uh, product. So if you're if you're spraying, if you're putting out a foliar spray for citrus leaf miner, it's also important to be mindful <laughs> of the flush. A lot of these citrus pests, outside of mealybug, really they're they're whole life cycle revolves around what the tree is doing. It revolves around the flush because the flush are its major food source. And if you're using a foliar treatment application for leaf miner control, you, you want to be treating uh, when the leaf miners are present. If, 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 you, if you treat when, when your larvae aren't there, then, then you, you're, you're throwing away your money. Um, and really the best window um, to, to protect um, your newly uh, unfurled flush is between 13 days after bud break and 31 days after bud break. So it's about two weeks after the buds break to, 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 um, to four weeks after the buds break. That, that's kind of the window of opportunity to have the most impact on leaf miner populations because that's when you're, 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 you're targeting those, those actively mining larvae. Um, so again, it's, it's important to kind of watch when that bud break occurred and, and treat between two weeks and, and, and a month afterwards. Other, otherwise, um, you're, you're not getting the most bang out of your buck. And, and these, these treatments are, are so expensive that we want to make sure to get the most out of them. And of course, the, the um, systemics, you, you're, you're going to have to wait 10 to 14 days after application before that concentration of insecticide builds up. But if you use a systemic, like a soil applied neonicotinoid or, or the cyanotiazapir treatment, you, know, you can get eight weeks, in some cases more, of, of, of management of young trees with these chemicals. Um, it's, it's amazing to me how long, for example, cyanotrinoprol or cyazapir um, 
works against uh, against leaf mite when it's it's soil applied. It's 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 really a, a an effective treatment. And of course, the 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 leaf miner uses pheromones, and this is something that we've tried to work with for a number of years, and we've had we've had success. Um, the problem is that the formulations have been expensive until recently, and the industry has been facing a tremendous challenge with HLB, which makes a uh, uh, an expensive chemical for what's now a secondary pest, you know, kind of difficult to, to, to manage. But let me kind of talk you through where we've been and, and where we've gone. And I, and I think pheromones uh, might actually find a way into leaf miner management um, in the future with, with some of these new formulations um, that, are, that are coming down the pipeline. So the, the females produce a pheromone. Um, and, and, and this is the chemical here. And then the males use this pheromone to find the females. And it's the only way the males can find the females. And these, these little things find each other at night with this pheromone. And it's only after the males mate the females that the females can lay eggs and you get larval infestation. So the idea behind the pheromone is in, to interrupt this. You put out the pheromone and you prevent the males from finding the females and the females never get mated. And, and, and then you don't get eggs. Um, so we first tried to do this with um, this splat formulation. Um, and of course, the challenge is we, we got a treatment after quite a bit of R&D that worked really well, but it was expensive and, and HLB was just, just hammering the industry and, and getting worse year after year. And is with as expensive as this product was, um, they couldn't gain traction for, for and, and that's completely understandable. The other drawback behind this formulation uh, is it, it required a, a, a rather specialized applicator. But when you could get the formulation that we finally got applied with, with two applications per year, um, you, can, you could really knock down um, the, the leaf miner's ability to find females. This was by uh, trapping them in pheromone traps. And most importantly, where, where the rubber met the road, you can, you can knock down uh, infestation um, with this. Like I said, the problem, one of the major problems was you needed this specialized applicator, which we built um, with the collaboration of a, of a grower um, who's also a very good engineer in the Fort Pierce area. Uh, and this was a collaboration between myself and the USDA with Steve Lapointe before Steve retired, and we were pretty. This this um, this machine was just attached to a track tractor with a three point hitch, and you essentially just pump the the this this waxy material um, in this in this box with gravity, um, and it and then it was uh, pumped into these blowers, and these blowers fanned the product onto the trees. And, and, and this was all precision controlled. Um, so we didn't, since the product was all, it was so expensive, we, we, we were able to, to apply some precision agriculture and, and, and really got it down to, to uh, you know, with cameras and lasers and to, to, to where we were not wasting a, a, a gram of product. Um, and it worked really well. Now, the, the, then the challenge came is, we we were trying to get a second applicator. We had only one applicator, so try to try to hunt down one applicator for an entire state. So this it, it became too much of a challenge. So then we we moved to a just a hand applied dispenser where the pheromone was just in this plastic um, little dispenser on these bread clips. That's it. It's that's that's the the how um, low tech this was. And all you had to do is you had to clip this onto a tree branch um, at the very beginning of the season. And then it would, it would last season long. And again, this was a, um, a, we had a collaboration in 14 and 15 with the USDA and the Packers. And, um, and, and this, we applied approximately 350,000 devices to 3,000 acres. Um, the cost that we got to about six, to eight dollars per acre, the application cost, and um, and the pheromone was still fairly expensive then. Um, 
And the results were, were, were quite good. Um, again, we were able to prevent the male's ability to find the females. And, and we got infestation that was um, comparable or better to insecticides. And you can see we compared it against two insecticide treatments, uh, this A and B, which were, which were quite heavy, you know, a lot of, a lot of chemical input. And we were able to, um, to accomplish the same thing with this, with this decept. Um, <clears throat> but again, the, the, the pheromone was expensive and um, there were a, a, a couple of growers that um, liked using it and, and incorporated it. But as, as HLB continued to uh, wreak havoc, it, it became expensive to, um, to apply this and, and, and these, these treatments became phased out. Now, uh, during this time, the cost of the pheromone synthesis went way down and, and a much larger company um, called Pacific Biocontrol contacted me two years ago and they were able to get the, the pheromone cost way down. And they said, do you wanna, we think we can get this at a, at, at, at a cost that the, the growers could afford even with HLB. And, and, and but the, the, the challenge still is um, the application, right? We had the, the challenge with um, that splat or hand application. So what I've been playing with are these aerosol units. <clears throat> this, is, this is what it looks like in a tree. It's essentially a little sprayer. It's got this little hood on it. It hangs in the tree. And you can see here is a little spray device. And it's loaded with a, a can that looks like a spray paint can without the, without the nozzle that you would spray. But the spray paint can loads into this, this device. And the device um, turns itself on between 7 uh, p.m. and 2400 hours midnight. So it runs five hours a night. That's when the leaf miners are out. And during this time, every 15 minutes, it squirts out a little bit of pheromone. And you, we, we've been looking at these at very um, low densities per acre of crop, anywhere from um, a quarter of a unit per acre, meaning one unit every four acres, to four units per acre. And we've, after some R and D, we've we've nailed down the amount we need. We know we need six grams of, of pheromone per acre to work, and then we monitor this with trapping CLM and doing um, infestation damage. And what we've been able to find is that with with six grams of pheromone per acre, irrespective of the density of these puffers, they're called puffers for obvious reasons, um, we're able to. <clears throat> decrease the male's ability of finding the females significantly. And, and even with <clears throat> one uh, puffer every four acres, if, if you load that puffer with 24 grams, you, you get the same result. Um, <clears throat> and importantly, we're able to reduce infestation about four times um, with, with any of the puffer densities, um, as long as we get that six grams of pheromone per acre out there. So I've been pretty excited about this. And um, the company's used the last two years of data uh, and they've submitted their registration. And so I think we'll have these puffers and you can again, hang one of these puffers every four acres. So, you, and, and you just hang it in the beginning of the year, you put the canister in and you turn it on and that's it. And the canister lasts for 220 days. Um, <clears throat> the other formulation that they have are these plastic, um, they call them ropes. It's just a piece of polyethylene that has a wire running its length. And I have it on a bread clip here, but you can just clip it right on the branch. And then the pheromone um, just comes out over time through the polyethylene, just, just the heat of the sun warms it up and, and the pheromone uh, happens. And these work even better. Uh, the problem with these is you gotta put them on. We, we tried them at one every other tree, this half a dispenser per tree, one per tree and two per tree. And it, and it didn't matter if we went down to 200 per acre, the one every other tree, we, we got nearly 100% of disruption of the male's ability to find the females. And this was in small plots. Um, as, as you increase the plot size, I think you'll, you'll, get, you'll get even better uh, uh, decrease in infestation because what I think it, what's happening is that these 
these mated females are coming from untreated plots into our treated plots. But even in this case, we're able to um, decrease the damage by the leaf miners by three and a three and a half fold. So if you're able to put these on by hand, I mean, they go on as fast as you can put them on. You just have, I, I, I put a sack around my waist and I have a whole stack of them and I just go and I put one on every tree or every other tree. But the puffers are also uh, useful. And what I think, uh, <laughs> what I think these could also potentially have um, uh, a, a positive contribution in cups to reduce leaf miners in cups. So I wanna, I wanna try this year, um, I'm talking to some collaborators uh, of, of trying to put these out in, in, in cups also. So the registration is underway and the cost of this should be comparable or, or lower to insecticides. Like I said, this company has gotten the pheromone synthesis um, uh, way down compared to what we were working with in the past. So with leaf miner, the window of spraying for citrus leaf miner, if you're gonna spray foliar insecticides, and you can find those all in the Florida Citrus Pest Management Guide. The window is about two weeks to four weeks after bud break. That's, that's when you should be applying. And you wanna apply your soil systemics about 10 days to two weeks before you're, you're, you're gonna need that control because that's how long it takes for the insecticide to build up in the tree. <clears throat> Pheromone mating disruption interferes with the leaf miner's ability to mate. So it, it decreases infestation because it keeps females unmated. We've tested several formulations over the years. They've worked, but they've had various challenges, cost, application, and a much less and easier to apply formulation is going to be available soon. The, the it's being registered now. And I think it could be a very useful tool um, for, for citrus leaf miner. It's going to be much less expensive. You, you just put it out at the beginning of the season and season long and, and, and hopefully the, the, the cost will be affordable even with HLB. So that's all I had today. Um, and I don't know if I have time for questions. Thank you, Dr. Serensky. Any question or comment? Feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question. Well, I'm around always too. If you ever want to give me a call or an email. <clears throat> Any pheromone work on the salads? Um, well, <clears throat> there has been a um, an academic debate on whether the psyllid even has a pheromone. And there has been some, there have been some people, um, it does produce something that seems to be attractive at short range, but this insect is visually oriented. It's an insect that uses vision to find its host and it's really dominated by that host. So we have not found anything reliable chemically that you could use to to affect its behavior to get control. I mean, God knows we've tried, but um, uh, I think that's a dead end. A question from the chat box. How long for those BT protein or BT plants to be in market? Well, so um, we have an advisory panel on, on this grant. This is a USDA NEFA funded grant. And in that advisory panel, some people, smarter people than me have told me that it's going to be really difficult um, uh, uh, to, to get them registered because the registration costs are so expensive and it would need to get somebody that wanted to register. Now, last week, uh, uh, somebody else told me from this, our Florida citrus industry that, that they were in a meeting with the apple growing folks and they heard that the registration costs aren't as great. So really the, the, the trees are, um, are ready. Um, I'm going to be putting them in the ground this year just to kind of see in a, in a small plot how they grow under natural conditions. Um, and if, if, if somebody were to pick this up and license it, you know, it, it, it would be ready to go. Um, now I've been doing over the course of this project, 
um, some uh, surveys with consumers and growers are excited. Growers for the most part aren't worried, but there is some consumer pushback against a transgenic crop. Um, and, and those are some, some hurdles and challenges that um, will be difficult to overcome. Uh, and that would require the right kind of marketing. Um, but if, if somebody were to invest in this, I mean, I, I think it would, could be available very soon. Um, now it's, it's a matter of somebody wanting to, to do the registration costs for these. these this, it would essentially be a new, new release, new variety release. Any other question? That's quiet. Thank you again, Dr. Selensky. Absolutely, anytime. Thank you, Alison. You're so welcome. Thank you all for your participation. Again, if you are interested in CEUs, please send me an email and include your name, your email address, and license number. Thank you all for joining us and see you next time. Thank you.